Thanks, guys. Well, thank you for um, the invitation to come. I love, I love doing this. I do it once in a while. I've done it up at the University of Utah a little bit. As Jen said, I am uh, I'm the Vice President of Operations at Chemtech Ford Laboratory. We're the largest local lab in Utah for uh, doing analytical chemistry in the environmental arena. So we, we have a large market. We do a lot of drinking water testing. We impact you every day. In fact, I see a bottle sitting on a desk here. We're, we're one of the labs that does the testing on drinking water. And I'll tell you a little bit about my story, about how I got started. I, I was just a normal kid coming off a mission back in 1988. Came back looking for a job. So I was looking, you know, just bef before my mission, I worked custodian. And so I worked at a school cleaning, you know, cleaning a school up to after nasty little junior high kids. And got back and I was like, well, I got to do something. Well, I started putting applications into grocery stores and, and I had a neighbor that was a vice president at a, a laboratory here in town. And it was a fairly large lab. It was actually bigger than Chemtech. And so he said, well, we've got some technician jobs. You, Jim Perkins, you remember Jim? He was just around the corner from us. And he, he, I got a job doing the lowest thing you could do. I was dumping samples, washing uh, glassware, and even worse than that, I was ordering ordering these analytical standards that they either took 10 years off my life or added 15 years, one of the two. They were, they, these are some nasty chemicals. So I was doing everything I could. And the cool thing was, you guys won't understand this, was that I had a job where I got to use a personal computer. Well, back in 1988, uh, no one had personal computers. Just the most basic, cheap personal computer was like three grand, and so nobody had that. In today's money, that's the equivalent of about seven or eight grand. So it, it was pretty expensive. So I got to work on a personal computer, and I didn't have to clean floors, I didn't have to mop, I didn't have to, I, a, at a school, I didn't have to clean up after junior high kids. So I was pretty happy that I was involved, even though I had kind of some gross jobs at the lab, I was happy that every once in a while I got a put my fingers on a keyboard. And um, I took advantage of every opportunity I could to be on that. I tried to understand what it was all about. I tried to understand the program behind what I was using. And so I took every opportunity I could. And as I, I worked roughly every day, I worked full time going through school. I went through school full time and I worked full time. Um, so, but I, every chance I could, every chance I could, I would talk to a senior chemist and I'd say, how does this work? How does this work? Um, tell me about this calculation. What, what happens here? What's going on with this piece of equipment? Why is it doing this? And so I asked a lot of questions and I credit that to, to my evolution of my career is just asking, 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 asking. And pretty soon it, I started asking, hey, can, can I help you do this? If you show me how, I'll do it. And then can I help you do this? And can I help you do this? And so pretty soon they were handing more and more tasks off to me. As, as I was going to school, I took the bus. I was, we were really poor. Jake doesn't remember how poor we were. He wasn't even born, but we were really poor. So I took the bus to school. And as I'd pull up, they'd drop me off and I'd walk about a half a mile to the, to the lab. And I just remember s telling myself, someday I'm going to own that place. I didn't know how, but someday I was going to own it. And I, I, I just always knew someday I would own it. <coughs> so my career, so I was going into school and business. I didn't really want to, I love the sciences. I always have loved them, but I kind of wanted to be a business person. And uh, so I worked my way through college as a lab technician. And when I graduated, I, uh, my boss came to me and said, do you, do you want to stay here and just be a chemist here? And I thought, well, that'd be kind of cool. I'll do that for a couple of years. Um, 
Uh, that'd be fun, and then eventually I'll go be a stockbroker, and I'll make a lot of money doing that or whatever. So I, I, I finished school, and honestly, during school, let me, let me just tell you, school, there were some great classes, and there were some classes that didn't make didn't do anything for my career. And so I'll, I'll be honest with you, it just they weren't great. I had about a series of four, five, six classes that were awesome. One of those was accounting, understanding the nuts and bolts of how accounting works in a business, balance sheet, assets versus capital, and all of those things that we learn in, in accounting. Economics, I took three economics classes, just an intro to economics, and then I had micro and macro economics. Incredible, those, those shaped how I thought. Um, one of the theories that I still run off of, I learned in economics. Economics, Who, anyone in here had econ, just basic econ? <coughs> great, great courses, it, it, was, it was great because it helped me understand the world in general, how economics worked in general, also helped me understand how the markets worked. I had a, a grasp on the markets. It also taught me how roughly corporations worked and how people thought in corporations and some of the, why some of the decisions were making. So really powerful classes. I had two law classes, I had a business law, that was incredibly important because I started thinking about decision making when it came to law, you know, so if you make a decision here, what are the potential consequences legally, how could that affect a business? I also had a real estate law which was kind of a rehash of the business law but it had some focus on, on uh, on real estate as well. So that was, those were cool classes. But the most important class I had, by far, was a, a class in something called Quattro Pro. Has anyone heard of Quattro Pro? Quattro Pro? Anyone heard of Lotus 1, 2, 3? Anyone heard of Excel? Okay, so it was, it, it Quattro Pro, so Quattro Pro was a copy of Lotus 123. Lotus 123 was kind of the first spreadsheet that really made made it big and made spreadsheets popular. Quattro Pro copied it almost word for word. It was it was incredibly cl close. So Quattro Pro and Lotus 123 about the same thing. And then Excel came in and copied those guys. And Excel just Microsoft did a better job at marketing themselves and kind of put put Quattro Pro to bed. But what I what happened when I took Quattro Pro, remember I'm working at a laboratory and we do everything by hand. So we do all these calculations by hand. We we print all these things and we do reports and we manually type these things. Well, I started as I was taking this class, I thought, well, I could I could use that in the laboratory setting, or I could use this function in the laboratory, oh, I could do this. And pretty soon I had built this, this, uh, this poor man's database of all of our reportings, and I made this incredibly fast, functional um, data reporting system that probably saved 80% of the time that it used to take to write a report up. It was just so much faster. And so all of a sudden, my, my the chemists above me are asking me to help them with their data processing issues. And so I, all of a sudden, I'm an important piece of the, the equation, and, and I'm automating all these manual processes, and I'm just a lowly technician. I was probably making between 5 and $8 an hour at that point. Um, and back in the 90s, that wasn't terrible. It, it wasn't, you know, I mean, it, it was fine. But these guys were making three or four times what I was making, and but they're coming to me and asking questions and asking me to do these things, and all these responsibilities are coming on my shoulders. And so I just started growing my career, and then on in the same time, I kept asking questions. Well, how does this work? How does that work? What, what happens here? What, um, you know, what what can I do to make it more uh, efficient? So I always had, I always had this 
theme in the back of my mind that kind of drove me. There's always a better way. There's always a better way. And so I was always looking for the next thing that would improve a situation. Well, I uh, graduated, became a chemist, and at some point down the road, someone came to me and said, hey, we want you to come over to this other laboratory. We have some older equipment. We know that you know how to use that, and we want to automate some of that. And so I was recruited to leave my first lab that I'd been there for about nine years. And um, in the meantime, when I was at the first lab, I started a ski shop. I don't know why I did it, but I just thought it would be fun. And, um, and it was fun, but it was hard. Uh, if you ever want a, a really cool industry to be in, it's the ski industry is really cool to be in, but it's a lot of work because you work from Thanksgiving until Easter, and the only day we'd take off was Christmas, so it, it was a lot of work. Didn't get to ski very much, which was a bit of a bummer. So I'd started this when I was at the first lab. And the cool thing about working in a lab is you have a lot of flexibility. So I could work at night and do the ski shop during the day. And uh, this other lab, come, they came and they recruited and they, they me and they said, hey, come over here. And by the way, we know about your ski shop and we're cool with that. We want you to come here and want to automate things. Well, I didn't know this, but they were really looking for me to to become director of the lab and so I came over there and um, kind of a cool story so the owner says hey in the winter time it just pretty much shuts down here it's slow it's really the summertime we get really busy so the ski shop works great for us and I said are you sure and they're like yeah absolutely well it turns out it was really busy that winter and and I'm like hey you know this isn't what you told me and he said oh just this is the owner he came to me he goes just teach me how to do the ski shop and I'll go run the ski shop during the day. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so it was kind of, it was kind of cool. He was, he was going and running my ski shop while I was running his lab. <laughs> and uh, um, so I evolved in, in there and I started automating processes there, started working on databases and I was promoted to be a lab manager, lab director there and started automating things, doing things that no one had thought of and uh, back in 2000 is when we, st it was 2000, so that's 16 years ago, we started the very first paperless laboratory. And to this date, there aren't many labs that are paper. We, we generate, take that wall right there every year, about half this wall, we generate that much data in, in banker box size paper. So we, we generate a lot of data. So back in 2000, we figured out how to go paperless and have all of our data accessible at a, at a moment's notice. And uh, so we were doing some really cool things. We automated their data systems. We, had, we, we put in all these cool controls and, um, and, and all of this started from my curiosity of how do I make it better? What can I do to improve a process? How can I make it easier on everybody? About 2001, someone started recruiting me from Nevada. And does someone need to get that? And <laughs> uh, in, in, uh, I probably have mine on too. They'll probably call me. I should turn mine off. Huh? Uh, a, a lab in Nevada called me up and said, hey, we've, we're seeing what you're doing over there. Why don't you come over here and do this? And I thought, well... I have kind of a good gig here, you know. It was a lot of work, but I'd kind of gotten it on cruise control, and it was, I got to go golfing every day, or not golfing, but I'd go to the range and hit and golf once a week and go to the range about every other day. And so it was kind of, it was good. But I was getting bored at that point. So I, I just, I was ready for another challenge, and uh, thought, let's go to Nevada. And so we moved to Reno. And I got to this lab in Reno, and I knew within one week there that this lab was not going to make it. It didn't matter what we did. It wasn't going to make it. Uh, they, they were in so much debt. And I, I, I failed, so let that be a lesson to you. If you ever go, do your homework on a lab. Do your homework. And uh, So anyway, I'd, I'd, I'd already shut down, and they'd already hired to replace me at the other lab, and I'm off to Nevada, and 
we gave it a go and sure enough within a year it, it, it was time to shut that down and I spent another year there trying to get another lab going but getting a lab going is a tough thing to do it's very expensive it's very there's a lot of um, it's hard to break into markets and so spent about two years in Reno and with my tail between my legs I came back to Utah and I took a job with the government for about a third of what I was making in Nevada and uh, I, I'm not gonna lie to you it wasn't a lot of money but I was so grateful to have a job and it was probably one of the best things I ever did because I got a job with the state where I now got to audit laboratories and so we're highly regulated we have lots of we have lots of uh, lots of rules and lots of regulations and I got to now go into every laboratory that was certified by the state of Utah and and learn about what they did and share my knowledge of what I had done and pretty soon I had a consultant coming and asking say hey you don't want to do this you don't want to be a state regulator do you you want to go into consulting so I started consulting with him I didn't really want to because I really wanted to I, I thought I thought you know what I'm just gonna behave myself and be like my dad and work for the government for the rest of my life and I'm gonna retire and I'm not gonna be a ladder climber anymore well I I so I he this guy came to me and said hey Paul let's let's do a little consulting I'm like I don't want to do consulting I'm I'm gonna be like my dad just Paul come on just do a little bit just a few hours a week and so I got permission to do it and I started doing some consulting and that was it I just yeah I couldn't I couldn't be I couldn't work for the state anymore a and I loved working with the state I'm still really good friends with them and I went into the state and I started automating all their processes and things that used to take two days now took 30 seconds and I loved doing it but it, it became this consulting thing was really fun well I started doing consulting I started doing national consulting and all across the country and one of my clients Chemtech Ford came to me and said why don't you come work for us full-time I said there is no way I'm working for you full-time I don't trust you guys I didn't tell them that but I didn't trust them so <laughs> so I, I they, they approached me two or three times I said okay here's how I will do it I I will come work for you if I get a piece of ownership in the lab. Remember when I used to ride the bus, I always said, I'm going to own that place. And so I'd never forgotten that little piece. And so we worked it out where, where um, it, I was on the I'm on the path to purchasing out Chemtech. And uh, the coolest thing is, um, you know, when I got to Chemtech, it was, I didn't realize this because I was consulting with them and they always put on a happy face for me. But when I got there, I was realized that the happy face was really a frowny face and in a big way, and there was a lot of cancer. There was a lot of cancer there. And so essentially we had to start from ground zero, clean everything up, clean all the bad habits up. We had to clean all the, uh, we had to slowly get rid of people. And um, mostly people left on their own when they realized there was a line drawn, you can't cross the line. And so we kind of got things straightened out and then um, started automating things more. It became much more automated. The data quality started going up, started s solidifying relationships with clients. And it, it was starting to get pretty okay. It, it wasn't great, it, but we were kind of to a point where our turnaround times were decent. They weren't spectacular, they were decent. So I worked with the other owner, and I sat down with Rex, and he, you have to realize Rex is this old school, 1950s, he would have been a great mine boss. He would have worked well in the mines, you know. You're going to go in, you're going to work, and you're not going to complain, and if I see you doing anything but work, you're going to, you're going to be in trouble, and I'm going to fire you, you know. He would have been good at that, um, and I've told Rex this, you know, and so, um, so I sat down with Rex one day. I said, Rex, I have this idea. Someday we're going to have unlimited vacation. He's like, no, you're not. <laughs> I said, well, you're right. 
but someday we're going to have unlimited vacation. And someday we're going to have incredible flexibility because, uh, well, when you own the whole company, you could do that. And I said, okay. And uh, so I sat down with him. I just planted the seed. And um, about a year and a half ago, I was able to persuade him to do this new plan that I, I call flex time. I started looking at the numbers, and here's how our, our, wor our workload goes. In the winter time, we get, uh, let, I'm going to make this number up a little bit, but about 2,000 samples a week. In the summertime, we get about 4,000 samples a week. So, you guys are all business. Are we all business in here? This is a business class, right? What does that mean for labor? If I have 2,000 a week and 4,000 a week, does, what does that mean? Say that again. I right. Okay. So there, you would expect though there there would be more labor in the summer versus the winter. Well, I went through all the times, and it turns out in the winter time we're averaging about 40 hours a week, and in the summertime we're ag averaging about 41 hours a week. So what does that mean? We're faking it, right? And and we can't just say, well, in the winter time you're you're only part-time, and in the summertime, you're full-time. That, that would not be very cool to... Would you anyone want to do that? We're going to give you benefits for half the year. No, you wouldn't want to do that. So we kind of need to be... So I said, look, Rex, here's the reality. People are faking their hours. Now, when you come in town... He lives in California. When you come in town, people act like they're busy, but the workload says they're not busy, so let's not pretend that they have to be busy during then. So let's do this new program where we are just going to say, look, we're going to pay you for 40 hours a week no matter what your hours were. So roughly it's salary. Well, there's a lot of mistrust among the employees and Rex doesn't trust the employees. The employees don't trust us. But nonetheless, we introduce this program called Flex Time. And so we introduced this out, and in the winter time, we introduced it in the winter time, and hours stayed kind of close to 40. People were pretty nervous, like, if, if I'm not working close to 40, then someone's going to fire me. Well, we started working through that and say, look, no, this is serious. I want to see your hours drop. So we got to the summer, and, and they had kind of dropped down into the mid-30s, like 35 hours a week, but I knew that you know, they were still kind of dragging their feet. Well, the summertime came, and it was a pretty busy summer, and the hours stayed at 35. No one was pushing 40, because they knew if they went to 41, they weren't getting paid for it. And so the hours stayed at 35, and then in the fall, the hours started dropping to the low 30s, and in the winter, they're in the, in the low 30s, high 20s. And so what we did is we created this environment where we just want you to get your work done. We just just get it done and and you can't just you can't there's there's a level of quality you have to meet. If you get caught cheating, we will fire you. If you get caught um, cutting if you get caught doing something illegal, you'll be fired. If you get caught doing anything wrong, <coughs> we'll get fired. Well, it worked pretty well. Our turnaround times all of a sudden went really high, and that was one of the requirements. You got to get your work done. And so we're you know, our turnaround times are roughly two weeks. Sample walks in the door, we have two weeks to get it out, the results out the door. Well, our turnaround times, when I first started at Chemtech, were in the 70% on time. And before flex time, we were in the high 80s, low 90s. And after flex time, they went to the mid to high 90s. Is how can I do it better? How, what can I do to make this process better? How can I get better quality? How can I make this less painful on the employee? How can I make it so they like coming to work? And so we have now introduced what we call Flex 2. Um, and that is, that, that's due in part because of a governmental change by our beloved administration who, man who doubled the wage for um, a salaried person, and so we had to make some accommodations. So we made some accommodations, but what we've done with Flex 2 is made it so instead of working five days a week, everyone can work four days a week 
if they want. And really, we're, we're to the point where if they wanted to work three days a week, they could, as long as everything gets done. So what it's done is it's bred this environment, instead of the environment of, what can I do to get my job done and stay out of the spotlight? And it's now a matter of the team works together to what can we do so we can all get out of here on time. The whole premise behind flex time is to bless the lives of the employee. And there's no trick involved. I want people to spend more time at home. I want them to spend more time doing the things they love to do. And when they come to work, I want them to love what they do when they come to work. And so they work better as a team. They work better as um, the quality, like I said, the quality has gone up by quite a bit. And uh, in relation to that, we have been able to bring in more work and not hire more people. And so we're able to share that extra revenue with the employee. So they're very motivated to, to be efficient because when they come to me and say, I need another employee, I just say, that's fine. I'll take it out of your weekly bonus. And we give everyone a bonus every week. If, if you want me to take it out of that, I'll hire another employee. And everyone says, uh, we'll, we'll figure it out. <laughs> we'll, we'll do it. So it's, it's been really cool. People are on board. So I'm a lab guy. I love, I love innovating. I love um, process management. I love making a process better. Um, the, business, the business piece of it helped me because now I understand certain business things that you need to know that, as Jen said, chemists don't know. They, they just think everything's great coming out of school. Um, I, I, I just love what I do, and I don't think it matters what arena you go in. You can figure out how to love what you do. I, I wanted to be a stockbroker. I ended up in the chemistry business, and, and I love it. You know, I love... I love everything about it, and that's not true. I don't love everything about it, but I love, I love, I love the business in general. I just love what I do, and I've just gotten to the point where now, instead of working on daily problems, I'm working on tomorrow. So I, my focus is completely on tomorrow. What are we doing tomorrow? In the next three years, in the next two years, the next ten years, where are we going? And so that's been cool. So that's that's roughly me. Um, I'm I'm not super smart. I'm just an average guy. I got a B through college and you know, I was kind of the king of the B. Whatever I did, I I just wanted to get a B out of it and I really wanted to work more than I wanted to go to school. But um so I, I I'm not really big into straight A's. I mean if you get straight A's that's awesome. But um so yeah, it, that's that's what I do. Am I hiring? Well, <laughs> I, I am hiring. Um, you, you do need a little bit of microbiology if you're if you're interested in it. So, and and that's the other thing that flex time has done is we don't hire very often, and it it di it also weeded out some bad actors, the ones that didn't want to pull their weight. They they learned pretty quick that they needed to go and they weeded themselves out. It was, it was good. What do I look for in an employee? I give a resume about 30 seconds when I look at it. And I look for, for a couple of things. If they're a college graduate, I look to see if they worked during college. Why do you think that would be important? The work ethic. So he said work ethic, multitasking. Time management. Time management yep, prioritizing. Responsible. Say that again. Responsible. Responsible. Yep, that, that's, that's important. Very, very important. I've had students that went through school and they had good grades and they never worked and they were the worst students, or the worst employees I had because they didn't know how to work. They, they knew academia, they knew how to get good grades, but they got into a pressure-driven environment and they couldn't handle it. So I always look for um, the combination of school and 
work experience. I don't really care what the work experience is. Um, if you worked at Subway to put yourself through school, awesome. Um, but if you just went through school and your mom and dad paid for it, I, I, you, you don't, it, it's harder for you to get hired with me. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's, my, that's what my experience shows. Tell us more about opening the ski shop. So this is really impulsive of me. I was working at a lab, and, and this lab would go through these highs and lows where, man, it was great, and lots of overtime, lots, making lots of money, and then all of a sudden the work would dry up, and there would be nothing, and we'd go through layoffs, and luckily I made it through all the layoffs, but I just decided, you know, I'm not going to hang my hat on someone else's highs and lows and so I just decided I'm going to start a ski shop. I started researching it out. What would it take? What equipment do I need? What size location would I need? Where do I locate it? And then I just started plugging away at chipping away at all the pieces of ordering skis. I found a location. I found someone that was that it was a good location because it was right next to a ski clothing store and they didn't want to sell skis or rent skis, and so I, I j it was just a persistence of doing that, and um, just started out nothing, and, and the cool thing was we didn't have money for advertising, so it was all repeat business, and it was all word of mouth. The only thing we had was, uh, we had a, a, a one-line yellow page ad, ski rentals, and, and once we got someone in there, we... <coughs> We were able to keep them because it wasn't a an 18-year-old kid renting the skis to him. It was someone who was a little bit more um, on their level, and they could talk. I could talk to him, or my wife could talk to him. And so it was really cool when when we had the ski shop. When when we closed it, when we moved to Reno, I had someone track me down in Reno, saying, "Where are you guys at?" I have been trying to get some skis from you, and you're not there anymore. And so somehow they had found me in Reno, <laughs> and uh, that I thought that was cool. Um, we'd have people come in, and it, this was a dive. It was literally a dive because we couldn't afford much. And I'd have people coming from the East Coast saying, "Our friends said we have to come here because you guys, you, know, y you treat people well." And um, that's the only thing we did different. We didn't have great equipment. We didn't have a great facility but we treated people really well and we gave them a good a good price. Why longboards? Okay. Um uh you know so I don't have a great answer for that. Um my my uh second son, not Jake here. My second son um was looking on KSL at skis and he saw a ski press and he just had his mind set on this making skis and I thought there is no way I can uh, that's a lot of work I don't think he knew what else. so anyway someone bought this ski press and he was just devastated so I did a little research and I found this press and we bought a press we found this guy that made long boards and and um, in the and we were eventually we're gonna make skis but we just started making long boards and we've sold a few of them and we haven't made a lot of money doing it, but <laughs> it, it's just fun. And we love the outdoors, our family. We love, we love what's called the, I, I love what I call the thrill of the, I call them gravity sports. And so the thrill of the turn, you know, how gravity pulls you in the turn. So longboards do that and skiing does that and snowboarding and uh, mountain biking and all those have that thrill of the gravity during the turn so it just kind of fits in with what we do so the question is is there a need for consulting and my answer is yes if you have the experience you can't just come out and be a consultant the reason I was successful as a consultant was because I had washed dishes I had run samples I had learned mass spectrometry I had learned spreadsheets, I had learned databases, I had learned um, the regulatory side of auditing laboratories, I had written programs, and I had done that. And so that's why I was able to do the consulting. If you're just going 
to school to become a consultant, you, you need to rethink that. You need to have the experience because my clients would come to me and they would say, Paul, you've done this before. What do you think about this? And then I was prepared because I'd lived it and saying, well, you might want to think about this or this and this, but I would go this direction. So you need to know, you need to know what you're doing. So that's why don't be shy. If you work at Subway, not, nothing, I'm not beating up on Subway, but if you work at Subway, you should learn everything you should, could know about Subway because somewhere down the road, that experience will come into play. I had, I had a, a, when I was working at Olympus Junior High in high school, so I was in high school, I worked at Olympus Junior High. Anyone go there? I went, I worked there, and I had a boss, he said, he t took us up one day, he goes, someday you boys, he called us boys, you boys are all going to be executives, and you're going to come in on the weekends and do your own cleaning. Well, guess what? Every once in a while, I come in on the weekends and I do my own cleaning, and I train my own custodians to clean a certain way because I t was taught a certain way. So everything I have learned along the way has come into play. So don't discount any job you had. I delivered pizzas when I had the ski shop. I don't discount that because I gained experience from that. Every job you have gives you an experience and that needs to be put in your arsenal because someday it'll come into play. It's not just a job. I, uh, do I currently own Chemtech Ford? No, I own, I own um, a small piece of it and I'm in the process of doing a buyout. So it'll probably take me 10 years to do that. And that's okay because I'm having a lot of fun along the way. What advice would I give someone who wants to follow my path? Um, I would say that you have to be patient. I remember I came back from Reno making a third of what I made and it took me a good 10 years to get back to what I was making in Reno and, and it took a while to, to bounce back. So you have to be patient and you have to, you, you can't be afraid to go through the hard steps like going and working for the state for a third less of what you made. Because I gained more experience there than I did anywhere else. I gained more contacts there than I did anywhere else. So you have to be patient. Um, that's another piece is your contacts. You always have to build your contacts. You always have to work with people that you know. The, are there any downsides to the flex time model? The answer is yes, there are. Um, it, on occasion, I have some employees working 26 hours and other employees working 43 hours. And that causes a little bit of animosity between them. And so the flex two is trying to equalize that out. Um, we're always, so we're always evaluating, always reevaluating. I'm never firm on this is going to be the, the way it's going to be for the ever. Flex 2 will evolve into Flex 3 at some point. Um, there's been some abuses of it uh, early on. Uh, we coupled with Flex time was we gave people what we called floating holidays. They could use those. And someone, but there were rules tied with them. If you're going to take a floating holiday, you have to be caught up and you have to be do this and so forth and so forth. Uh, we found people would come and violate those rules. And so then we would say, okay, if that ever happens again, we will take that away from the entire laboratory. So the downside to flex time is if you, you have to draw a line in the sand, if that line gets crossed, you have to address it right away. You can't, you can't let it go because it'll ruin it for everybody. So we've, we've worked out roughly most of the, the issues with it. Um, it's really cool because uh, we have become a laboratory that when, when a sample comes in and someone needs it in a rush, we call it a rush sample, that's clever, I know, but um, so when a rush sample comes in, it's usually someone is out in the field and they've dug a hole and they've got $10,000 an hour waiting on our, our $200 analysis. So they don't care if we charge them a rush fee. Um, we used to be terrible at rushes. 
someone would walk in and say, can, how fast can you do this? And we would say, well, let me go back to the lab and find out how they're doing. And they'd go back, uh, we can do it in six days, six working days. It's like, okay, we'll go to another lab. Well, now one of our rules is we will accept any rush no matter what. So the cool thing about flex time is if a lot of, so I, have, I have an employee that comes in at, I don't know, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, and he's l gone by 3, 3.30 almost every day. But then there will be nights where I'll come in and he's there till midnight fighting to get a rush done. <laughs> Thanks, guys.